time for petitions. You know, it's between a rock and a hard place. Remember that you must determine these election petitions within a very short period because of the emotive nature of elections. For example, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Zambia, they, by the time the parties were filing pleadings and so on, the period had lapsed and the petition was dismissed on account of time. In Ghana, in the, last, in the second last election before this one, a Mahama's petition was determined after one year, long after uh, uh, Ado had sat in the office for a year. In my view, taking all the factors into place, anything between 30 and 45 days is sufficient. Even today, as you notice, although we hear the petition in 14 days, we end up rendering the, the final decision in 30 days. That is 44 days. So that for me, if parties are allowed time to file their pleadings in good time, the court allows parties time to argue their cases substantively. The court can, in three weeks, render a good decision. The first 2017 Raila decision, if you remember, was close to a thousand pages. If you add the dissents, that cannot happen in a day. That can happen in two days. So, for me, from my experience, 2017, any period between 30 and 45 days should be sufficient for the parties and for the court. Caleb, uh, you've made two uh, uh, mistakes in your submission. I have never been to the Court of Appeal. I'm one of those judges who was lucky enough to, to, to jump from the High Court to the, court, to the Supreme Court. So I never sat in the Court of Appeal. Two, you are referring to the Raila decision of 2007. I do not recall such a decision. What you may have been saying is what I said earlier, that because of the 2007, 2008 uh, 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 election uh, violence, because of the, uh, uh, um, the allegation that Raila had won the election, there was no confidence in the courts. Yeah. And I said so myself. And I've said so elsewhere. I also said that, in fact, that, that time in 20, 2007, we handled about 83 election petitions arising from other elections. Our obsession as a country with presidential election petitions is what the problem partly is. Now, have we as a judiciary lived up to expectation of Kenyans as regards our resolution of disputes arising from elections? To a large extent, yes. But remember, for every decision you make, there is one party that is happy, one that is unhappy. If you look at the voters in 2017, in 2013, almost each president, each winner was always having just slightly over 50%. So that even if we were to render a decision whichever way, we would still have people who are saying, almost 50% saying, we are not happy with that decision. That's the nature of our job. We have to believe with it. What is important, however, is has the judiciary, has the Supreme Court looked at itself introspectively and said to itself, what is ailing us? What are our problems? And I think over the last five, ten, seven, eight years, we have had that conversation. Even as late as yesterday, when we, when we, when the LSK, the ICJ met the JSC, to make demands as regards what kind of CJ they want, it is about transparency, it's about accountability of the judiciary to the people of Kenya. The judiciary does not have any authority beyond that delegated by the people of Kenya. So it's a continuous conversation. And when you come to the bar, wherever you're going to go, you have to add to that conversation. So, so for me, I mentioned the limitations, but I also mentioned the strengths. In my view, the judiciary of Kenya is very highly regarded with all our problems. Their judiciary is much, much worse, far much worse than ourselves. Let us never always throw our baby with the bathwater. An interesting and I think more fundamental question that you asked, Caleb. And I can tell you that even within the court today, there is still a whole debate as to this question of the binding nature of advisory opinions. You have seen that the court more and more has rendered itself on the terms recommendation, the term advice, 
And if you look, for example, at the at the uh, Commission on Revenue Allocation case, where we, we interrogated the question of recommendation made by the Commission Revenue Allocation to the Senate, we were categorical. We have also, in other decisions, determined what an advice is. We have also said what, what is binding and what is not. So I think your, 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 your worry about uh, uh, adverse opinion number one of 2011 uh, the court is lucky in that it can overturn its own decisions where it finds that it's wrong. I have very strong views myself about the binding nature of adversary opinions. But that's all I can say for now. I was not in the bench that determined those matters and I have not sat in any bench where we have reiterated that the uh, advisory opinions are binding. I think you'll hear from me in due course when the matters come properly before me. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Yes, Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith, you're muted. The mute is muted. Okay, I'm here, Jazz. Yes. Sorry. Uh, I, I was saying I, I look forward to the issue of advisory opinion coming up again and the binding nature. Um, it's, it's quite heavily debated in school. Now, um, there was another person, another round of questions. David Maporo, your hand was up. David? And any other person who wants to ask questions, please uh, put your hand up. Uh, but let's give this chance to David. David Maporo. Actually, the question has been conversed concerning the advisory opinion. And I think I'm contented for now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, any other person with a question? Um, Judge, I think let, let's let's look at the chat um, for the time being. We can look at the questions on the chat. Uh, Emmanuel, do you have a question? Okay. Um, sorry, Judge, there is a question. Uh, on the chat, not, not very clear to me, but yes, there's a question from Ivy Waloe. Um, yes, yes. Sorry, I'm, I, I'm not seeing the questions very well. Judge, are you able to see the questions on the chat? Um, let me see, Ivy. Okay, probably, Judge, we just start right at the top. Yes, um, okay, go ahead. I'm, I'm having challenges. Okay, I think it's it's now back. Um, we can, there was a question uh, by Caleb Omondi, it was posted at uh, 1510. Caleb's question was, there is a growing perception that the Supreme Court should be disbanded for the reason that it has lived way below the expectation. What's your view in, on this? bearing in mind its jurisdiction, which you have eloquently spoken about. That um, answered. Yes. That. Then uh, Brian of Yambo says, Your Lordship, kindly clarify on the place of injunctions and conservatory orders in succession matters. Um, and then Kyle uh, asks, are advisory opinions of the Supreme Court binding? And to what extent? I think, Judge, you've addressed that. Uh, Caleb Omondi then goes on to ask, do you agree with the Supreme Court decision that an advisory opinion is binding? Which I've is answered it. Yes, that you've answered. Um, then, um, yeah, yeah please. Uh, Mayende says, good afternoon, Honorable Judge, kindly comment on the scope and binding effect of advisory opinion. Judge, it appears uh -huh. that the advisory it's opinion... A, it's a big uh, thing, huh? It is a big thing. Uh, then Brian of Ziambo again at 15 in the recent decision by the Supreme Court on the Maitobel case, uh, the Supreme Court apparently circumvented the question as to whether Kenya is a monist or a dualist state or a hybrid of the two, kindly clarify. Um, I don't know what Brian meant, but probably it's in the context of treaties. Uh, then Nyawa 
Joshua Malizo. The Supreme Court has been accused of engaging in legal sophistry since the days of Peter Gitarao Munya by inventing the doctrine of normative derivative. Is the Supreme Court on a fishing expedition to expand its jurisdiction? Um, Judge, I don't know if you can comment on... Uh, yeah, yeah. Let, let, me, let, me take, let me take those. Um, Bran, um, injunctions on succession matters. Um, Cap 160 is, 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 is not any special than um, any other dispute. If, for example, you look at Article 45, uh, Section 45 of the Law of Succession Act, if someone were to inter uh, intermeddle with an estate, how else can the, the executors or by, by the beneficiaries get their rights uh, secured unless an injunction is issued under Section 45? If, um, uh, say, a dependent were to invade an estate and claim that uh, they have rights to the estate because they are dependents of the deceased, how else would the executors or the beneficiaries stop that from happening unless the, issue, the injunctions are issued. I do not see myself any controversy. In my days as a trial court judge in Kakamega, in Meru, in Machakos, in Embu, I issued injunctions whenever those was necessary uh, 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 in succession matters. What perhaps I should say about injunctions is this. There is a growing perception that we in the judiciary are issuing ex parte injunctions rather too liberally. That should a person appear before you at 2 o'clock, they walk with an injunction at 2.30, and for the next five, six months, that injunction is being enjoyed. Or if you're a banker, trying, a bank trying to sell some property, and someone walks in at 2.35, and they obtain an injunction to stop the sale, they'll enjoy the injunction for four, five years. So I think for me, the, the, the more problematic issue about injunctions is the manner in which ex parte, even ex parte mandatory injunctions are issued. I think that's a cause for worry. I've spoken at judges' meetings around that question. And so for me, that is a bigger worry that I'm seeing uh, uh, with, within us as a judiciary. In Middlebell, um, did we avoid the modest dualist uh, um, uh, principle? I think the issue, that issue didn't come out as clearly as it should have in Middlebell. I think what, what came out more was the place of uh, the UN guidelines and, and whether they are, they are binding upon Kenya as a signatory to some of the conventions that we quoted in that decision. And, and I, I think myself that once again, if you pick a judgment selectively and, and determine that uh, the court has not addressed the question, then you are missing the fact that a judgment must, read, must be read holistically. What is the context in which that judgment looked at the monist dualist uh, 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 theory? It was in less than two paragraphs because it's not a fundamental issue that was raised in the pleadings. And Mitubel was a very complicated decision, as you noticed. One, the judge, in fact, for me, Mitubel should be looked at more in terms of the entrenchment of structural interdicts in our jurisdiction than anything else. Because that matter had to go back to the High Court, for the High Court to make, fun, to, to make final orders as regards other issues. So I think to pick on the monist, dualist, one paragraph, pick on the UN guidelines, two paragraphs, and forget the fundamental finding that structural inter interdicts have a place in our constitution is to mislead the judgment. So, so I think that should not be the main focus of the judgment. There will be a case in which, obviously, Article 2.5, Article 2.6 will be fundamentally dissected by the court. And that, that case is not Mitubel. Mitubel had a wholly different uh, uh, um, uh, uh, focus, and the focus was, was on the issues that came out of the case. And remember, Mitubel came as a general public importance matter, the place of housing, the place of evictions, and the place of structural interdicts. It didn't come as an international law matter where monist dualist questions would be anchored in Article 25, Article 26. So I think let's read the judgment in this context. Is the Supreme Court uh, engaging in legal sophistry or legal juggling or legal gymnastics? Um, the normative derivative uh, uh, principle in Nemunya, I think we must appreciate that every court, when, we, when, when the Constitution says that the Supreme Court is mandated by the Constitution to develop rich jurisprudence 
that respects Kenya's history and traditions and facilitates its social, economic, and political growth. That court cannot be a traditional court. It cannot be a court that looks to precedent only. It must develop Kenyan homegrown jurisprudence and give it meaning within our, our, our context. So that the settlement of the issues around the rights of, uh, the right to, of appeal to the Supreme Court from the Court of Appeal by parties and at 163-4A was settled in Munya, settled in, uh, 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 in, uh, in uh, Le Manque and Aramat, but more fundamentally explained and expounded on in the uh, uh, Wambora petition in 2017. So instead of us getting stuck in what the court said in, in, uh, uh, in, uh, in, in uh, Munya, why don't you, for example, look for the election petition determined by the Supreme Court in favor of the governor of Embu Wambora and see how the court explained this confusion, which is apparent from uh, misreading of, of Munya, in Wambora. So please read Wambora. And you'll see how the court rendered, developed, explained, expounded on, and clarified what it meant in, in Munya. So, so I think it was not a question of legal sophistry, juggling, or, or, or gymnastics, uh, or ping pong. It was, and that's why the court must keep developing, must keep explaining itself, must keep, in cases to come, clarify confusion arising from past division decisions. And that also goes to what I said about advisory opinions. The court needs to come out clearly and explain why an advice in one case is binding and another it is not. Why a recommendation is binding in one case, in another case it is not. And therefore why Munya was clarified in, 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 in Wambora. So, so for me, read the, the whole jud the judgments in totality. I think the position of the court is, uh, 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 will come out. But in my view, like I said earlier, to now attempt to uh, crucify the Supreme Court, which is barely 10 years old, because of one or two decisions, I think it's too too unfair and quite too early uh, to start crucifying the court. There is time for the court to develop and settle the law, as it has done. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. Um, I'm yeah, Judge, the, the other questions on the chat. Um, at 15.19, Ivy Waloe asks, uh, Good afternoon, Judge. What is your opinion on what the court can do to ensure court orders are followed? Uh, then 15.22, Otieno Clinton asks, uh, Was it normal that all the Supreme Court judges stayed away from sending applications to fill the position of CJ? Is there something to fear about the position? Does the popular presidential election dispute in 2017 have something to do with it? Um, and then the third question at 1528. Uh, good afternoon, Your Lordship. My question relates to the Supreme Court's decision in the case of Muhammad Abdi Mahmoud versus Ahmed Abdullahi, Muhammad, and three others, where the Supreme Court upheld the governor's appeal despite the governor not having relevant academic credentials on the basis that the question of a university degree is a pre-election dispute. In my opinion, despite the court interpreting the law correctly, the interpretation led to an unjust outcome. What, in your opinion, should courts do to remedy such an issue? Uh, Judge, would you take the three? Well, thank you very much. Um, I think one of the Speaking as a judge now of um, going to 18 years um, uh, experience and 13 years in practice, so going to 30 years plus as, as, as a lawyer post-qualification at your school, is getting increasingly worrisome to me that uh, the country is going to a situation where court orders are really nearly being defied. Uh, by lawyers, by parties, by the executive, by the... You know, whether we should choose as a country whether to have the rule of law or the rule of the jungle. So, yes, I share your concern and I've expressed myself without fear or any, any, any fear at all. What should courts do? I think myself that on this one, the, the courts must take the blame. Um, why do we have contempt 
rules, like I spoke about in our own rules, if we don't impose them? Why do we have um, all these procedures for bringing parties to bear for displaying orders? We don't do it as often as we should. I recall, for example, one time when uh, um, I sentenced um, my good friend uh, Atoli for contempt of court, and I slapped him with a fine of half a million. Parties were telling me, no, 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 you should. I said, no, no. You see, my reasoning then was that the contempt had been committed 10 years before the order came. In between, parties had played around ping pong. So even if we punish a man 10 years later, and the issue that was causing the concern had... So I think perhaps we ourselves should have a conversation as judges and say, are we being hard enough? Are we being de 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 deterring enough? Or are we just slapping people in the wrist? Or none at all? So IV, I, I, I cannot say more than to say the courts must grab the bull by the horn and start imposing sanctions. Otherwise, if we don't, then uh, we, I don't know why we issue orders in the first place. Then. But, you, know, um, you know, let me be flippant and simplistic about uh, the issue you've raised. You know, when you apply for a job, it is a personal decision. There is nothing called Supreme Court judges have refused to apply. There, there is, it's, not a, it's, not a, it's not a corporate application. It's not a, it's not a joint application. My own reasons for not applying are personal to me. And uh, if you look for me, I don't live too far from the School of Law, so you could look out for me one day at... Uh, then I take you to Royal and buy you a drink and tell you my reasons. Um, my colleagues have their own reasons. My own understanding is that each one of us, having looked at the issues, that whatever they have and their own circumstances, said not to apply. I doubt that uh, the fear of uh, what happened in the election petitions is a reason for, at least not for me, I mean... Uh, I actually think that I've faced more difficulties in my decisions at the High Court than I faced uh, in that one decision. So I, I don't think it's a, it's a factor. It may be a factor for other judges. I don't know, but not for me, certainly. What I would think myself is that everybody has their reasons for applying or for not applying. And those reasons then, uh, if, 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 if they became the main reason for not applying, I guess it's, it's, it's their right to apply or not to apply. For example, suppose someone had uh, intended that they never want to go beyond the position of judge of the, of the Supreme Court. How do you stop them? I know judges who have been in the high court as, since I was in high school. I came and found them there. I left them there. They're still at the high court by choice. Do you force them to apply because the position is vacant? So I think the, the best I can say is that people have different reasons for not doing certain things. I have my reasons. Uh, and, and I would ask that we respect that the decisions taken in matters are really personal to people. Um, on the Wajir decision, Mahmoud, uh, Mohammed, first of all, I was hoping that you, the, who, who had asked the question, uh, whoever had asked it would say that I have read your dissent. Did you read my dissent? Who, who asked the question? Mr. Simi, who asked the question? Let me just, I, I think it's uh, Muhammad Ali, let me see. No, Alex Mwendia. Alex. Alex. Yes. yes. So, so, so I respect Alex to say, Judge, I have read your dissent and I agree with you, I don't agree with the majority. Because in that decision, if you remember, I dissented. And, and, and like any judge, you must stand by your dissent. But also as any judge, I must live by the decision of the majority. Because the decision of the court is not my dissent, it is a decision of the court. And that is a law until, like I said earlier, until the court itself determines that the dissenters were right. And therefore, the, the law on qualification, the law on pre-election disputes can be overturned in the way that uh, myself and retired Chief Justice Maraga said. So, so that's all I can say. I, 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 uh, you know very well the old story that um, dissents sometimes are prophetic. And they become the law 10, 20 years hence. And, and Lord Denning is quoted as being one of the more uh, forward-looking and prophetic dissenters. I'm hoping that my dissent will become prophetic in the same manner. That's all I can say about the Wajir decision.
Um, thank you, Judge. Judge, we, we have just about uh, 14 more minutes, uh, so allow me to engage you more. Um, Go ahead, please. Judge, I've been informed that the offer for a drink has received uh, 350 acceptances. <laughs> you should be prepared. <coughs> I'm ready. <laughs> okay, thank you. Now, uh, Judge Mohammed Ali uh, at 15.30 asks whether a judicial officer implicated in corruption should step aside. Uh, at 15.32, Lilay Prudence wants to say, good afternoon, Your Lordship, expound on the appeal process in the Supreme Court, the documents to be filed, timelines and rules applicable. Then uh, number three, Kennedy Odoyo wants to know at 15.33 what your opinion is on the issue of stepping aside in courts of public officers implicated in corrupt practices. Is stepping aside grounded in any legal parameter? Uh, Judge, you can take the three. Yes. Um, Mohammed and Odoyo, uh, juicy as the question is and the burning as I am to answer it, those matters are before my court, um, including one that is pending judgment. So I would, uh, with uh, respect, ask that I be I defer those questions to my next session. Uh, once the decisions have been given and the court has rendered itself as a court, then I can comment on it. But for now, I'm afraid uh, those matters are both before my court and also the courts below. And it would be wrong if we respect the principle of subjudice. Uh, for me to say anything about them. Um, Lele, I don't know why you're asking me to do your research for you. Um, as you know, I employ I have two legal researchers do my research. When you ask me the appeal process, what documents to be signed, what to be filed, what... Um, I earlier said that if you look at the Supreme Court Act, the Supreme Court Rules 2020, Supreme Court Practice Directions, and uh, the Supreme Court... Uh, presidential election petition rules, all your answers will be given there so that uh, it is not uh, right for me to now pick up the, the books in front of me here and say, uh, Prudence Lele, for you to file an application for the Supreme Court, Rule 4 of the presidential election petition rule says you must uh, have the following grounds uh, and circumstances, uh, that you must have the question, the validity of the election, the qualification, an offence committed, validity of the nomination, and so on, because that would be uh, repetitive of what is really in print, and the presumption is that by the time you get to school of law, you're able to read and write, please read those ones, and if you have any question uh, which is uh, specific, then you may ask Mr. Smew, and I can respond directly through Mr. Smew. I thank you. Thank you, Judge. Uh, judge, at 15.34, Edwin Onyango, it says, good afternoon. What is the effect of declaring the law unconstitutional, as in Francis Muruatetu, considering that it takes time to amend the relevant laws? Uh, then Emmanuel Fwamba says, your lordship, I would like to know your view and any background knowledge that informed the drafting and inclusion of the two-prong procedure to limit access to the court. Uh, is addressing your lordship on Article 164, sub Article 4. Uh, I'm not so sure if it's 164, he meant 164. 163.4. Yeah, 163.4. Uh, then he goes on to say that especially in looking at the right to appeal in matters that lie to and from the High Court uh, to the Court of Appeal. Uh, probably, Your Lordship, let me add another one from Marianne Awiti at 1544. She says, Your Lordship, what is your opinion on the proposal by the BBI committee to have a judiciary ombudsman? Judge, you could take those. Yes. Um, thank you. Thank you, Onyango. Um, you know, once a law is declared unconstitutional, it remains unconstitutional. Um, so that in terms of affecting it, we don't need to have um, a, a, a repeal of the law or anything to be done to the law. It is upon every party. Remember that uh, the constitution binds every person and every organ. So that once it's declared in a constitutional, it's brought the, the knowledge of the parties, whatever party or whoever else is affected by it, it's their business to comply with the law. In Murateto, for example, the order was directed at the Attorney General to then create a mechanism by which uh, cases, which past cases could be addressed. 
what happened was a confusion that then arose. Two things happened. One, the Attorney General took much longer to address the question of what happens to the cases. For example, you know that we have more than 10,000 people on death row. All these people would like their cases reviewed for them to mitigate. We wanted a structured way of those mitigations to be done by the trial courts. So that was the first mistake. The second mistake was that then, once these review applications came, the courts below did not notice what we said in the Muratetu. We said these orders will apply only to Muratetu and his colleague until the structure is created by the Attorney General and by the courts. Suddenly, everybody then had a free for all. So, in fact, some people who were not, who, some people who, who, who had been sentenced to death got their sentences reviewed before Muratetu got his sentence reviewed. In fact, I doubt that Muratetu's sentence has been reviewed. I think it was hard. I have not read the judgment or decision in which it was reviewed. So th that is, it was a procedural question, I think, which you are concerned about. The second problem that arose was this. Where as we had limited ourselves to, case, to this case of murder involving these two people, pending resolution of the question as to the structure of other death sentences, Magistrates' courts then picked up this case, this Muratetu case, and applied it mutatis mutandis in robbery violence cases, in rape cases, and so on. So I think it was the affecting of the decision, implementation of the decision that created the confusion, not the decision per se. And that's all I can say about uh, that. What created Article 1634? In, in most jurisdictions, the apex court has a very limited jurisdiction. In trying to craft that limited jurisdiction for our Supreme Court, after back and forth and debates uh, with uh, all these professors and uh, others, it was agreed that two fundamental principles must be applied. One, constitutional questions must be determined at the highest court. Hence, Article 163.4a, that where a matter involves the interpretation and application of the constitution, then you shall appeal as a matter of right. And we then explained how those matters must take a trajectory of interpretation from the High Court, the Court of Appeal, to the, to the Supreme Court. And so it's, a, it, it's all about the supremacy of the constitution. The, the highest court really must be able to interpret and apply the constitution because it is a constitution. That was the reasoning for the first question. The second question was matters of general public importance. And again, you can see the reasoning behind that uh, jurisdiction. You are saying some matters require finality by the apex court because they transcend the specific circumstances of the parties who had initially filed the case. And therefore, matters that go to the public, like matters about the environment, effluence, matters around deforestation, matters around housing and so on, squatters, evictions, which affect more than one, more than two people, a defendant and a plaintiff, such matters ought to be determined at the highest court. That was the reasoning in my, in my recollection about these two jurisdictions. But there was a jurisdiction that, by the way, uh, uh, we have all forgotten, which is very unique, that there are instances where an appeal can come directly from a tribunal uh, to the Supreme Court. And, and you'll all remember that uh, uh, that jurisdiction has not been affected at all, yet it exists. So that uh, in, uh, in rules, uh, Section 17 of the Supreme Court Act, before you come and say, I'm appealing from any other court or tribunal apart from the Court of Appeal, the rules say that the, 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 the section says, you must show why your appeal can come, say, from the cooperative. Uh, tribunal to the Supreme Court. And that was a very limited jurisdiction in the event a matter was so fundamentally important that it could jump the hierarchy of courts to the Supreme Court. But again, that has not been affected. No matter has come of that kind and no party has been able to justify what is so fundamental that you cannot go through the appellate mechanism. So so that is the reasoning behind those provisions. Marianne uh, you know, you know, the judicial ombudsman is a question in the referendum. This question also 
is pending before the Supreme Court and we are coming for mention of the referendum cases on the 16th of March. And one of the questions we are being asked is whether a, a referendum should have one question or multiple questions and whether it is constitutional to submit an amendment bill of the constitution to the referendum. Now, for me to express myself on any part of that bill would be unfair. So I, I decline to answer that question. Again, bank it for the drink with, uh, with Alex. Thank you, Judge. Uh, Judge, uh, we have two minutes. Um, probably I'll just take the next three questions. The rest of the questions, we can bank them for 19th and, of course, the drink. Now, yes. uh, at 1545, Caleb Omondi says, Judge, with the declaration that the Contempt of Court Act as unconstitutional, what law do you use to punish for contempt, especially since the same Contempt of Court Act repeals Section 5 of the Judicature Act? Chapter Oma at 1546 says, Good afternoon, Judge. As a former High Court judge, kindly comment on the following. One, what should guide an application, an applicant in deciding whether to apply for revision as opposed to an appeal? And two, does the revisionary powers of the High Court apply to orders emanating from the same High Court? And the third question is from Suda Said at 1546. She says, Good afternoon, Judge. In a scenario where the case was heard in the High Court, which is the better position to make? an application for appeal or to request the judge to review that decision. For example, if an integral witness was refused to be had by that judicial officer. Oh, thank you. Um, Caleb, when uh, Justice Muita declared the Court of Act unconstitutional, um, there was confusion as to whether courts could still punish for contempt. But remember, that the power to punish for contempt need not be in an act. We still have, for example, the contempt procedures under the Canada Cap 21, the Civil Procedure Act. The fact that the Supreme Court Act, for example, uh, has contempt procedures was not affected by Mwita's declaration of uh, unconstitutional contempt of court act. So, so it's not like we are limited, we, 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 we courts are impotent to punish for contempt. And in fact, in my view, the court ought to have um, an inherent judicial budget for contempt. And I want somebody to challenge me on whether a, a, a person who disobeys a court order can only be punished through the contempt of court act. So, so in my view, we are not impotent. And there should be no reason to worry that uh, we in the Supreme Court, for example, are not affected by the contempt of court act, cannot punish for contempt. I don't think so. Um, revision versus appeal. You, you know, um, revision is a matter where a magistrate's court has made a mistake and on its own motion requires that a judge of the high court should review, should revise that decision, or a party brings the attention of the high court that the magistrate's court has made a, a decision that requires revision. Ordinarily, it is not a substitute to an appeal. But in some instances, if, and ordinarily it's within ongoing proceedings, so that if you, if you revise a matter at the end of a ruling or at the end of a decision, one must be careful to only seek a revision on a matter that you, you are certain is a fundamental error that must be revised. For example, where somebody has been sentenced to say, if the law says maximum is, is, is three years and you get seven years, obviously, that requires a revision. Why do you go through the trouble of an appeal? But the presumption is that you are saying, I don't want to be sentenced to three years, to seven years. I want to be sentenced to three years. Who wants to do that? So an appeal is wholesome. It takes the question of conviction. It takes the question of sentence altogether. But if you choose, in your wisdom or lack of it, that you want to go for revision on sentence alone, so be it. So, so really it's about on a case-to-case -case basis and depending on the circumstances. Same with the Suda's question. Um, in civil law, the grounds for revision are not necessarily the grounds for appeal. So that you can only go on revision if you are certain that you have you fit your case within the grounds of or revision. Grounds of appeal can be as wide as you want them to be. So again, it's on a case-to-case -case basis. But I've seen parties that 
go for review, the review is denied, then they file an appeal against the review. And that for me is uh, not wise. You must make up your mind that if you're going to go for review, use the review procedure. If you want to go on appeal, use the appeal procedure. So, so really, again, it's on a case-to-case basis on your, in your circumstances and what wisdom is guiding your decision. But that is all I can say in those three questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Judge. Uh, Judge, it's three minutes past four. I know these guys need to scatter to different classes. Um, I want to tell them that uh, we are sorry the technical hitches we had at the beginning. The ICT has promised to do better. I know we have we are still hosting judge on the 19th of this month from 11 to 1. And uh, we will practically have three hours so that if all the questions come in, we can spend the entire lunchtime with his lordship. And That's from there, we can go for that famous drink. Um, I want to ask one of the class reps, Marianne Awiti, uh, to give a fairly short uh, you know, vote of thanks to his lordship on behalf of the afternoon classes. Uh, Marianne, uh, are you here? Uh, Marianne? Um, yes, I'm here. Good afternoon. Uh, my yes. name is Marianne Awiti. Um, your Lordship, uh, on behalf of every student on this call, we say thank you for finding time to share knowledge with us that you've ac accumulated over the years. We are grateful uh, that you found time in your busy schedule. And to our lecturer, Mr. Simiu, thank you for making this possible. And to every student also who managed to attend, um, thank you for sparing time and for uh, making this an engaging lecture. Um, and that is all. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you very thank much. You. Thank you, Judge, and uh, all, all the students. Uh, please feel free to join us on, to join Judge uh, and I on the nineteenth <laughs> uh, in the morning. Um, all should be well. Judge, do you want to say kwaheri? Thank you very much, and uh, I wish you well. Uh, your questions were very engaging, very smart, uh, and I'm very, very impressed. Uh, if you are, this is the caliber of lawyers you are producing. I'm, I'm very, very happy to see you in my court. Good luck. All right, thank you all. Um, have a good evening. Uh, thank you, Judge. Uh, let's wait for Judge to exit first. Okay, thank you. Judge is out, so we can also exit. <laughs>